Welcome, viewers, to our ongoing program, Focus, coming to you from the Channel 17 Studio Center for Media and Democracy here in Burlington, Vermont. I'm your host, Margaret Harrington, and viewers, I'm very delighted today to, uh, to have our show with Angela Patton, the poet and senior lecturer at the University of Vermont, Dublin-born. Angela is, and uh, we're kicking off the Burlington Irish Heritage Festival with a reading from Angela's poems here in the studio. And I have in front of me her books of poetry that have so far been published, Still Listening, Reliquaries, and In Praise of Usefulness by Angela Patton. And Angela is an award-winning poet and a wonderful, uh, a wonderful subject for our title of the show, which is The Irish Woman's Voice in Poetry. And to begin it, I'm going to read from High Tea at a Low Table, and it's the story of a working class girl growing up in horse and cart Dublin in the 1950s and 60s, and Angela strives to find her own voice amid the insistent clamor of family and clergy and the summer and the summons and lure of an unruly American future. So here we are, stories from an Irish childhood, High Tea at a Low Table by Angela Patton. And I will start it off, and Angela, the poet herself, will pick it up. Chapter One. On a sunny February afternoon in 1984, I drove into the parking lot at the University of Vermont in Burlington and found a parking space and switched off the ignition. Then I held my breath, waiting for the explosion. The Subaru was a real lemon in color and condition. I bought it for $500 when I left my marriage and moved into an apartment on my own. I was clueless about cars and terrified of driving, but I had to be able to pick up my son and deliver him to school. I didn't realize I would need to pour, for, to pour quarts of oil into the engine every day, and I cracked the block in my first month of ownership. I had to borrow another $500 to get it fixed, but the car still had a few disturbing quirks. For an intelligent girl, you can be very foolish, my mother would have said, clucking her tongue in disapproval. But she was far away in Dublin and blissfully ignorant about my troubles. I put the thought out of my head and reflected instead on the romantic poetry class I had just attended and the anthropology exam scheduled for next day. I was a full-time English major, putting myself through college with the help of a half-time secretarial job in the Center of, for De Developmental Disabilities. As a 32-year-old single mother in school with 19-year-olds, I felt somewhat developmentally delayed myself. My son moved unhappily back and forth between me and his dad, spending exactly half his week with each parent. It was a fractured existence, but I clung to my poetry and literature studies like a drowning sailor to a spar, not sure whether to cry for help or just keep paddling. I was walking toward the rear of the building when I noticed a young man coming towards me. I registered brown hair, slight build, faded plaid shirt. He repeatedly glanced right and left as he approached. Perhaps he's lost or has car trouble, I thought, preparing to offer assistance in my friendly Irish way. Get back in the car, he hissed. I stared at him, hardly able to believe my ears. I looked around quickly, noticing how quiet the usually crowded parking lot was, not a soul in sight. I was about to run in the opposite direction when the man took a gun from his pocket and pointed it at me. It was a small handgun that fit snugly in his palm. The steel barrel caught the sunlight and shone like a jewel. What was I to do? This wasn't a story I had read in a book. It was the real world cutting in, as if the radio of my thoughts had gone suddenly dead. The weapon created an immediate intimacy between us. There was something obscene about its sudden intrusion. I felt the rest of the world, the parking lot full of snow-dusted cars, and the red brick office building gilded in the pale light of the afternoon, fall away under my feet. My head felt light, as if detached from the rest of my body. I began to fumble in my bag for the car key. 
Don't make me use this, the man said in a shaky voice. Okay, okay, take it easy, I managed to mumble. I could tell by his face that he was serious. Suddenly, there was no question about what I should do. We both understood the simple, universal language of violence. I got back in the car on the passenger side. He took my keys and started the engine. As we drove down the street, I kept seeing people I knew, but they were oblivious to me. We turned the corner onto Colchester Avenue, and I thought about jumping out at the traffic lights. Lock that door, the man barked suddenly. I obeyed, sinking back into my seat. Please read chapter two. <laughs> <laughs> and now for something entirely different. <laughs> chapter two. It was far from guns and kidnappers I was reared, as my father might have said. I grew up during the 1950s and 60s in Sally Noggin, a working class neighborhood about seven miles south of Dublin City. This was an era in which the rag man, the slop man, and the coal man still came to our doorsteps with horses and carts. And Mr. Byrne, the milkman, arrived on his bicycle to ladle loose milk from a tilly can. In this pre-technological world, stories were our entertainment and our sustenance. The nuns at school terrorized us with tales of leprosy and the foreign missions, black babies desperately in need of baptism, and sudden appearances by celestial beings. The radio brought plays, sponsored programs, and serialized stories for children. There were true stories, too, like the assault by a priest that cost my father his eye, my narrow escape from being sent to an orphanage, and my first cousin's discovery that the woman he had always called Aunt Kathleen was really his mother. Over it all lay my mother's mellifluous but incessant talking that formed the foundation of my literary education. My mother and her relations were all great talkers. If they had been runners, they could have competed at the marathon level. My father, on the other hand, came from silent country people, and he was always warning us not to be talking to strangers. Country people, my mother explained, were moody and secretive. They're too quiet, and they never tell you about their affairs, she said, of our rural relations. But they're nosy enough to find out everything about you. <laughs> Mother, or Mammy, was born Annie Elizabeth Mary Swords in 1913, the daughter of a sailor from the north side of Dublin and a seamstress from the county Wicklow. She grew up in Glasthool, Dublin, cheek by jowl with countless relations and innumerable neighbours, a stone's throw from the seaside, the shops, the red brick Harold National School that she attended until the age of 13 and Glasthool Church, where she married my father in 1948. Her relations were all sailors, and we loved her stories of their adventures on the high seas with the British Navy, and the descriptions of the silk fans, lace shawls, and other exotic gifts they brought back from foreign parts. Dad, on the other hand, was a culchy, born in 1918 in Adamstown, County Meath. He grew up in a small, whitewashed house on one acre of land. His father had been born in the house next door, and although his five brothers emigrated to America, the move from one house to another was the only one our grandfather made for the rest of his life. These fundamental differences formed the basis of our identity as children. We were Irish, we were Catholic, we were poor, and our parents were as different as chalk and cheese. I grew up among Mammy's jovial Dublin relations in a world that was filled with sounds harsh, sweet, and various. There were the murmured prayers of the priests at mass, the hymn singing of nuns at school, the shouts of children on the street, the rasping lilt of paper boys, the rumble of double-decker buses, the metrical chuffing of steam trains, and the rhythm of dad's infectious fiddle playing. But the world came in at my ear most of all through Mammy's melodious voice, as she recited poems and platitudes, dispensed advice, sang Irish songs, retold the novels she read at night, and entertained us with the story of her life as she cooked and cleaned and cared for us. I was a shy, fearful, bookish child, and it was a long time before I discovered my own voice, still longer before I developed the courage to use it for my own storytelling as a poet and writer. Even within her own loquacious family, Mammy was famous for her incessant talking. 
Her voice was like a radio that was never turned off. It was the soundtrack to my childhood, as constant and inevitable as the rain. Dad was always telling us to keep to ourselves. Don't be gassing and talking, <laughs> telling everyone your business. Should they live in your ear if you'd let them, he'd say. But Mammy was incorrigibly garrulous and friendly. Dad tried to rein her in, but telling Mammy to stop talking was like trying to stop an avalanche with your bare hands. Although her formal education was brief, she left school at 13 to work in Leonard's greengrocer's shop in Dunleary. She had a marvelous memory and an unerring ear for language. She remembered all the rhymes of her childhood, including the one she and other Catholic children used to sing to tease the Salvation Army followers as they rang their bells along Dunleary's seafront promenade. The Salvation Army, free from sin, they all went to heaven in a sardine tin. <laughs> There were other rhymes that memorialized the various <laughs> outbreaks of disease, like the one about whooping cough. My mammy told me not to play with you, not because you're dirty, not because you're clean, because you got the whooping cough for meat and margarine. <laughs> My childhood memories are inextricably linked with mammy's quotations from Longfellow, Shakespeare, and Tennyson. Her favorite advice was, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man. She had once played Portia in a school production of The Merchant of Venice. Thirty years later, she recited speeches with relish. The quality of mercy is not strained, she'd declaim, as she cleaned the hearth on her hands and knees. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. She entertained us with droll recitations of the owl and the pussycat, or acted out the tragedy of the wreck of the Hesperus. I could just picture the captain lashing his little daughter to the mast, her long skirt billowing out behind her, and the waves crashing over the deck. If I didn't go to school, I met the scholars coming back, Mammy said proudly. She was an avid reader of adventure stories, which she devoured in bed after we were asleep. Next morning, we'd beg her to tell us about the latest chapter of The Sign of the Spider, set in deepest, darkest Africa, or the dog Crusoe, set in Canada's frozen north. Mammy seemed to have a bottomless well of proverbs and pithy phrases that she ladled out unexpectedly and with unflagging enthusiasm. It's many a man's mouth that broke his nose, she'd say, <laughs> and what you don't want is dear at a farthing. Her plentiful platitudes were irritating when she used them as spurs to better behavior. The sun is splitting the stones, she'd announce, as she maneuvered around our beds to whisk open the curtains in the morning. There is a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. All four of us children slept in the same small room for years, fiercely guarding the tiny territory of our individual beds from the others. In the meantime, however, Mammy had us all at her mercy. Let us then be up and doing, she'd say, as she attempted to pry us out of bed. When I was your age, I used to be up with the lark, riding my bicycle through the Wicklow Mountains, exploring this countryside instead of sleeping my life away. There was always an implied comparison between us lazy good-for-nothings and she herself, who was up earliest and doing the most. Ah, don't be always giving out, our Susan would plead from her untidy nest in the corner. None of us, least of all Dad, could fathom her gift for memorization or endless aphorisms and household hints. Leave it to Annie, he would tell us, rolling his eyes. She'll always have the last word. The radio with its pink satin face sat in the cupboard beside the fireplace in the living room. It was the center of the household, and it taught me early on to love the spoken word. It brought us news, game shows, comedy programs, and advice to the lovelorn in a series of half-hour programs that were sponsored by companies like Imco Cleaners and Dyers, Jacob's Biscuits, Fry Cadbury Chocolate, and Glen Abbey, makers of fine nylon stockings. Mammy loved Woman's Page, a sponsored program hosted by Frankie Byrne. This is Frankie Byrne with Woman's Page, the husky voice would commence. A program for and maybe about you. <laughs> now the problems we were discussing today may not be yours, but they could be someday. In any event, Woman's Page draws its material from the lives and events of real people. I was fascinated by the unhappy housewives who called into the program and the glimpse of a grown-up world full of romance and heartbreak. 
Frankie always followed her advice with an upbeat song by Frank Sinatra by way of consolation, or so I assumed. When she wasn't listening to the radio, Mammy was always singing. One of her favorite songs was The Blackbird of Sweet Avondale about the tragic Irish leader, Charles Stuart Parnell. She sang as she washed the breakfast dishes or peeled the potatoes. Ballads about young men like Roddy McCorley and Kevin Barry who marched cheerfully to their executions so that old Ireland might be free. The songs made me almost unbearably sad and I begged her to please stop singing before I burst into tears. The cupboard under the stairs held Mammy's treasured cookbooks and handwritten recipes, a purple chocolate box full of family photographs, and an album with lipstick images of Gary Cooper and Rudolph Valentino from her romantic girlhood. We kept our own bits and bobs in wooden orange crates beside our beds, and we wore our cousin's cast-off clothes. We licked our dinner plates and wiped our faces on our sleeves. But Mammy read aloud to us from Charlotte's Web and The Wind in the Willows, and we thought we were the luckiest family in creation. In marked contrast to Mammy, Dad was quiet, serious, and suspicious of strangers. He loved rivers and trout fishing. No matter how long he lived in Dublin, he always referred to County Meath as home. He had the Meath Chronicle delivered to the local newsagent's shop, and he devoured every word of it on Saturday afternoons when he sat in his special chair by the fireplace. He often went home at the weekends to shoot and fish with our Uncle John. When he came back on the bus on Sunday night, he laid his brown cardboard suitcase down on a chair and clicked open the locks. There, resting on the sheets of newspaper, would be a beautiful pheasant or a fresh, fresh speckled trout he had caught that afternoon and wanted Mammy to prepare for dinner. Dad also went sea fishing off the East Pier in Dunleary on summer evenings. I loved to trail behind and watch him toss the flatfish with their glassy orange eyes into the rock pool by the shore. I stared down into the sea's black depths and brooded happily for hours. At home, Mammy tossed the fresh fish in batter and deep fried them, and we feasted night after night on their succulent white flesh. Dad hated to be cold, and like a cat, he detested getting wet feet, so he would never even put his toe into the freezing waters of the Irish Sea. No matter the season, he always wore a tweed cap for fear of getting his head wet. The cap was a nondescript brown color that had molded itself to the exact shape of his head. Hair oil had softened the leather band inside to a kid glove texture. Dad automatically reached for it every time he left the house, set it in place on his head, and adjusted the brim with a practiced gesture. He raised the cap to salute acquaintances on the street. On Sundays he wore a felt hat out of respect for the Sabbath, but he always donned the cap again on Monday mornings. Dad loved Irish music, and he played the fiddle on Saturday nights in the back rooms of various pubs, although he never touched a drop of alcohol. He didn't have Mammy's gift of the gab, but he was a dab hand at making up stories straight out of his head. We all loved his story about Sonny the Black Doll. I passionately wanted a black doll, although the only non-white people I'd ever seen in the flesh were one or two Indian medical students in Dublin and a Chinese doctor at St. Michael's Hospital in Dunleary. For that matter, the only non-Catholics I'd ever seen were the Protestant girls from Clorinda Park School in Glasthool when they marched in a long line down to the seafront for their chaperoned weekend walks. They wore matching dark blue uniforms with funny-looking flat hats on their heads. They were fairly exotic, but I thought black people must be even more so, and I insisted that I wanted a black doll. Dad promised to bring one back from one of his trips to visit his sisters in Somerset. When he came home with the doll in hand, he told us all about the trip. You see, the trouble was that Sonny had never been in a plane before, he said, <laughs> handing over my new toy, and she wanted to try everything. We had never been in a plane either, only to the airport, so we could easily relate to Sonny's feelings. It was a twin-engine Dakota airplane, he went on. I sat her down beside me in her own seat and fastened her in with the seatbelt. She loved the sugar cubes the air hostess brought for her, all individually wrapped in paper. They were just the right size for a doll. Dad always brought sugar cubes home for us from his various trips to England, so we nodded gravely at this detail. Everything would have been fine except that Sonny kept slipping out of her seat belt to go exploring. 
She has a naturally curious disposition, Dad said. I held Sonny out in front of me. She did seem to have a mischievous glint in her black eyes. A drop of divilment was what Dad called it. One time she disappeared and I couldn't find her anywhere, he continued. He and the air hostess searched all over the plane and finally discovered Sonny down in the baggage compartment. I was never so relieved in my life, he said. Dad's story gave Sonny so much life that she took on a personality that the other dolls, Eileen, Roisin and Belinda, never achieved. A few years later, when Sonny's eyes fell into the back of her head, Dad came to the rescue. He took her out to his shed, pried off the top of her head, and replaced the rubber band that held her eyes in place. Now, Alana, he said, handing me the doll, you'd do well to keep her very quiet for a few days. She's just <laughs> undergone eye surgery. I was terribly impressed and followed his instructions to the letter. Oh, I love that, Angela. Thank, oh, thank you so, so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Have it. Do you need a little drink of water or something now before Happily you have a drink of water? You start yes. now. This the first one uh, of your books that was published was still listening. Yes. And that was uh, you launched that at uh, at the uh, the writer center in uh, in Dublin. In Dublin. Yes. Oh, how marvelous and that the, must have the been. The wonderful thing was my dad was there, and oh, he was so great. proud. He was thrilled. Yo. Yeah. And um, I was delighted to be able to do that, you know. Yeah. Um, well, you, you really ago. brought your, your young life alive there. And we can see you as the little girl with uh, taking everything in and remembering it and describing it so beautifully. Oh, thank you so much. So would you, would you start now with, with someone still listening? Sure, yeah. I would love if, if you would read, yeah. read something. I just and, wanted uh, to say um, that the memoir, in a way, is a bit of an introduction to the poems because they overlap and go back and forth between, you know, that life and the one I have now. Yes. And um, I think of Still Listening as being probably the most Irish of the books, you know, or yeah. the closest to that experience anyway. Yeah. Um, sure, I'd love to read something. So you're going to start off uh, with Fire Song, right? Yeah. And I think you'd be able to see some of the, um, uh, the life that I described in the memoir in, in some other ways. Okay. Fire Song. On Saturdays, the coal man in blackface upended his sack in a dusty heap at our back door. Father shoveled the jagged lumps into our shed where jackdaws rose beaked and furious to squawk at him from the flapping dark. Mother, acolyte to the gods of the hearth, knelt down to rake the ashes after breakfast. She carried cinders in a bucket to the yard, twisted newspapers crisscrossed kindling erecting an altar of coal and turf that pulsed with a tabernacle light. When father arrived at six o'clock, we froze in place, looking for clues to gauge his mood. He stood with his back to the fire, rubbing his hands together, rainwater pouring off his bicycle cape. The poor we have always with us, he muttered, as steam rose from his trouser legs. And to him that hath not, even that which he thinketh he hath shall be taken away. She shooed the cat from his chair, eyeing us into obedience, then raked the fire to give us alphabets on our legs and make our chilblains burn. She fed him with the meat that men must have. We gathered around the table to watch him mix Coleman's mustard in a wooden bowl, the spoon trembling in his workman's hands. 3,000 miles and a lifetime away, the radiators hiss and spit like vipers, reminding me to mourn that hub of heat around which we clustered, drawn together by a light we thought perpetual. Oh, I love that. I <laughs> Thank love that. you. It's so wonderful to read with you. I, oh, you're, you're so well, I, we, delightful. Well, we met traveling on a bus, yes, right? Yes, we and did. It was we such, did. So serendipitous. And now yes. here we are, and uh, you're... And viewers, we're, we're, it's going to continue on just for a little bit, and it's so great. Yeah, well, so, I've always loved having conversations yes, with you. <laughs> so, Lou, um, so shall Lucy. I read another one? Yes, okay. please. Um, I, I mentioned in the memoir um, about the milkman who delivered milk to the door, and, mm. um, and this is about that milkman. It's called okay. Loose Milk. Mr. Byrne carried a milk churn on the front of his bicycle. He arrived every evening at our front door, constant as the rain that dripped from the brim of his brown cap. 
He wore a cloth coat in summer and a heavy brown overcoat belted in the middle when the long evenings closed in. When she heard his knock, you could set your clock by him, mother sent us to the door with a battered saucepan. Mr. Byrne ladled the milk with a tilly can, smiling his mild smile as he backed away into the darkness. On Fridays, she took her handbag down from the top shelf to pay the bill. And even after the glass bottles caught on, she continued to take in the loose milk. Jack's a decent poor devil, father said, and the laborer is worthy of his hire. In those days, the thatch pub was still thatched, and Joe Gallagher's pig farm reeked familiarly from the top road. The slop man collected our leavings on a horse and cart. Mother washed her hands of dishes and took us to the seaside every day. I thought the shapes the rocks took on of armchair, sofa, table were a secret only I could fathom. When we walked home with our togs and wet sausages under our arms, past the bird's nest home for Protestant children and the beehive-shaped bomb shelter on the swan's hollow, when everyone turned out for the procession on those warm Sundays in May, the girls in starched communion veils, the women with miraculous medals on pale blue ribbons around their necks, the dark-suited men's sodality walking four abreast, all of us singing hymns and saying the rosary, past the front gardens where the old and sick were set out with the holy pictures among the flowers. Those were days I couldn't wait to flee, convinced that somewhere lay a larger world where bread came wrapped in plastic and milk was cold and cartoned. But now in dreams I'm flying over Pierce Close and O'Rourke's Park, over Rollins Villas and the shops and factories. Sally Noggin still has fields of bluebells and cowslips, and Jack Byrne rides his wobbly bicycle through the rain with a milk churn rattling the handlebars. Then when I awaken, confused by links of flesh and geography, I want to suck on that loose milk until the cows come home. <laughs> oh, I love, I love that, Angela. Well, and uh, what you. Good comes, I see it's so visual, your poetry is so visual, and you make the past into the present, so it comes alive to us. Oh, thank you. And then I'm thinking, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, but for you, uh, a word is worth a thousand pictures. I suppose you could say that. I've always <laughs> been kind of audio rather than visual. Right, right. And of oh. course, we didn't have television until I was about 12, because yeah. my father refused to have it until Ireland got its own station, you know? Okay. And so he wasn't going to have British television in his house. But um, I, I was so lucky to grow up with the radio rather than television. Yeah. You know? Although, of yeah. course, we loved television. But it was still very restricted back then, you know? Yeah. And uh, we all, uh, the whole family, though, loved words. Right, uh, right. It wasn't just myself, you know. Yeah, but it's a gift. I mean, you were taking it all in, mm -hmm. and you, you, you have it, and, and you're giving it to us. Oh, thank so you. So it's so great. You're very okay, kind. now what's next now? Let's see. Well, I'm wondering, um, this one, uh, it, some of these have a lot of similar images in them, but I was thinking of reading this one, Thatch Pub. Okay. 1958. Okay. I mentioned the Thatch Pub in the previous poem, but it was down the street from us, and, um, and it really did have a thatch in those days. Now it's a big, ugly barn of a place. But there are a couple of things about this poem. Um, it begins with Grand National Sunday. The Grand National is a steeplechase that's run in England, I believe, every two years, right. and it still is. So, and also, my parents didn't drink at all. They, they were teetotalers, or pioneers, as they were yes. called in Ireland. Yeah. And so, my father hardly ever went to the pub, and this was just a special occasion. And then um, uh, tato crisps are chips in this country. <laughs> and then woodbines are a particularly vile cigarette. <laughs> right. um, so those are, I think, I think I have to... Um, uh, yeah. Thatch Pub, 1958. It was Grand National Saturday, and our father, never a betting man, had put a shilling each way for the four of us on a horse called Oxo. After his dinner, we trailed him to the thatch to see the race, running a gauntlet of cap-shadowed glances as the men looked up from their pints to gawk at the strangers. I think the world was completely brown then. 
the smoke-filled air, the dun-colored caps of the drinkers, the dark oak of the bar and deeper dark of porter chased with a swirl of whiskey, the smell you'd sometimes get in the early morning after it rained when you walked over a metal grating and caught the waft of stale ale and woodbines rising up from the depths. Our father, thin as a whippet among stout, fattened neighbors, beckoned the barman while we clung to his coattails. He brought us orange crush poured sideways into tall harp glasses and tato crisps tasting of smoke and beer. The television blared from among the dusty bottles on a corner shelf. All eyes were glued to Oxo when our sister, nervous as a thoroughbred, clamped her teeth down hard and bit a piece from the fluted edge of the glass. Chaos oh then, gosh. everyone yelling, don't swallow, spit it out, <gasps> quick now, there, there, you'll be right as rain in a minute. But what struck me then as now was the suddenness with which everything can change. One minute you're holding on to your father, safe as houses. The next you've bitten through some invisible membrane and the world in Garrett Riley is shouting at you while you stand there like a gormless Egypt, your mouth filling up with fizzy liquid and delicate shards of glass. Oh my God. <laughs> Actually, that word gormless is what started the thing. My brother picked that up from the lads at work. Oh, and okay. To be an Egypt is to be really stupid, but a gormless Egypt is hopeless altogether, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> Well, let's, and now we go into this one, the reliquaries, like. right? I suppose that would that's be sort great. of in order. Um, yeah. I actually have to say that in this one, uh, because I kept having to explain Irish words, I actually put a little glossary in the back, which was fun um, it, to try to figure out which words might not be known in America or which were yes. Irish expressions. So that was kind of fun for me to do. So you, uh, at the you time. put in Gormless then? Right? Uh, well, no, that was the, in the that other was book. the other one, but, yeah. Um, bunch of things. Um, and this one feels a bit out of date to me at this stage. Well, they all do. But um, in this one, I was kind of experimenting in this book with an alter ego or a persona. Um, my original name was Goggins. And the original form of that was de Cogan. And oh. um, uh, a Norman name. Apparently, uh, the original de Cogan was Milo de Cogan, who was a Norman knight and went to Ireland in 1170. So <laughs> uh, my brother loves genealogy and he's done an awful lot of work on it. But anyway, I was experimenting with de Cogan as a, as a persona to get away from the first person pronoun. Oh. So this one's called Extremities. Ask any woman about her flaws and she'll describe them with enthusiasm. Ask de Cogan her slender fingers calcifying under hard upthrusts of cartilage, struggling awkwardly with jars and bottle openers, all deafness lost and long forgotten. Impossible not to feel pity for the hands divorced from the rest of the body. Unattractive harbingers of ruin, they're useless as a bent fork or artificial nails on a house cat. De Cogan's other parts have caught the news on shortwave radio, her knee bones crack with a sound like twigs breaking underfoot. She remembers her mother's hands better now than the rest of her body. Before she died, the fingers swelled so that the delicate bones with their flanged tips grew thick, their fine intelligence blunted, dull. How smartly they used to crack the eggs against the side of a bowl, smooth the pages of their old black prayer book, slip the blue rosary beads between their graceful joints while her lips moved in time with their rhythm, her whispered prayers rising and falling like the low drone of insects on a summer's day. Maturity means knowing that things end. De Kogan knows a day will come when there will be no more putting things on the long finger. These aches and spasms say that she's alive. So this is how it goes, she tells herself, I can't get over it. I'm noticing at the end of the, of the, the last poem, Till the Cows Come Home, and then oh, I, yes. I can't get over it at the end of that. It, that's lovely. It, it, oh, just, well. it, it just gets you in into it more. I love it. Well, of so. course, um, my Irish accent is such a hybrid now, but it's always in the turns of phrase that you hear it. You yes, know. yes. Um, yeah. And they do come back. Uh, okay, so 
Where are we going to? Let's see. I'm just being very arbitrary about what to read here. Um, I spent, Reliquaries was written after my mother died. Yeah. And so a lot of it is about her. And um, in fact, she died on March 14th, 1988. Mm. And uh, I found myself talking to her in my head without any belief in an afterlife. I had these conversations with her. And this is one of them. It's called Home Improvements. Mother, I just have to tell you about my new appliances. You wouldn't believe the way I've come up in the world. I only wish you were still around to see it. My refrigerator has an automatic ice maker and a filtered water dispenser on the door. And you know that's not the half of it, with my glass top stove, my food processor, and my dream home laundry room. I'm thinking of our tiny scullery at home and the great improvement you thought it was when someone gave you an early model washer that was no more than a dasher in a metal box. Never mind it took up most of the floor space, hopping around like a hen on a hot griddle, and you had to boil the water by yourself. All the mod cons, you murmured, as if you were Saint Anne, the patron saint of housewives, awestruck by a visit from the Blessed Virgin. <laughs> You were thinking of your own mother's long labor on wash day Mondays, the two-way stretching and snapping of lace curtains, the oppressive weight of wet woolen clothing, the scrubbing board, and the hard bars of unkind laundry soap. Still I have days of misery and self-pity that are gray as last week's laundry. Get out in the fresh air, you'd say, and thank God for your health and strength, your good fortune. And you'd be right, of course, except for the God part, which won't wash with me in any shape or form. But I didn't come here to argue, only to give you an update. I'd like to think you're off in the hinterlands, still interested in recipes and kitchen gadgets, still believing I can be improved. Oh, Angela, you're still arguing? I never stop arguing, you know. <laughs> My son says I'm the most stubborn person he's ever met, and actually, I, I've always been like that, you know, and, and often not in a sensible way. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you stopped here. So I didn't come here to argue. <laughs> I was lying <laughs> through my teeth. So I'm wondering what's next if now? we should move on to something else, or should I? Well, you you go with what you want, and, and I think that we'll amend. We'll we'll cut the uh, the maybe the Irish language. Okay. And, okay. and we'll just continue on with yours. And so, All just, right. Um, if you can stand it, that's great. Of course. Uh, I can stand it. <laughs> this, is, um, this is a poem I wrote after my father's death. Uh, my father died um, at age 88 oh. uh, on his birthday, which was the 12th of May. Oh. And um, uh, he had been alone without my mother for a very long time, 15 years, which he never expected. Mm. But we all went home for the funeral. Mm. Um, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. It's called That's All. Okay. In the wake of our father's funeral, we visit the cramped house where we all grew up, bringing our own children with us to reenact the receiving line we fled in a body back at the church and cemetery. We cluster like bedraggled birds in the front doorway, then fan out into hall and sitting room, scullery and yard. Tentative at first, because it's odd, isn't it, to be there without him sitting in his hard chair next to the heater that conceals the old coal fireplace, saying, close the door, there's a terrible draft, and isn't the weather very poor for your visit? We're not expecting much, knowing he threw out everything except the letters and the photographs as if accusing God of unfair treatment after our mother died. The grandchildren nose around, pointing out the pictures of themselves in all the faunal phases of their lives. How small it all appears from the wrong end of the telescope. We open drawers to find a pile of letters in our mother's hand, our proof of the lovers they have been. Impossible to think his bones are resting now, one up, one down, in their double-storied grave, and all her fleshy warmth turned to dust. And I don't care what they say, he wasn't lovely in his blue suit and blue tie and dry clean suit, as the undertaker, who was naturally a friend of a relation, kept repeating. And I can't get over his white hands or the taste of marble forehead 
on my lips. There are the letters we have written over all our years away from home, unopened gifts of dress shirts in their crackling packages, new socks and pairs like courting couples, the sets of fancy luggage he forgot to use. Sometimes he'd show up with nothing but a comb and toothbrush clutched in a plastic bag. Where was the leather travel kit I sent you for your birthday, you'd ask him, but he'd only smile and shake his head. There wasn't much he wanted, just the odd trip to a part of Ireland he hadn't seen in years, to admire the changes wrought by EU grants. New houses popping up like toadstools in the West for sons and daughters coming home from exile. Not like it used to be when he carried water for his mother's tea from the pump up the road, then gathered kindling for a fire to boil the kettle. Before rural electrification lit up the land and all the old ghosts down their tools and fled. No, there really wasn't much he wanted, just the music session down at Coltus on a Wednesday night, a lift up to the church for choir practice after mass on Sunday, his dahlias and tomatoes in the greenhouse, a nice slice of apple tart, a biscuit with his tea, a little company and conversation, that's all. He's a wonderful man. Yeah. Um, Comes through in, in that poem and of yeah. course then I had I had read about him in high tea at a low table. Yes, so. indeed. He was so. a wonderful man, and uh, I argued with him every day of my adolescence and drove him crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, would, would you, you like me to read the Irish poem, or, or will I go on to well, something? Well, I think that we'll, we, we'll, we'll end on, on your in praise of usefulness. Okay, okay? sure, and, that's fine. And then uh, we'll say, uh, you know, this is a celebration of of the woman's voice and of your mm. woman's voice in, in poetry, in Irish poetry, in poetry. I'm the yes. Irish woman's voice in poetry, your voice. And Angela, thank you so much for coming oh, here. Oh, my and, pleasure. And, uh, and uh, viewers, we refer you to the, how do you pronounce it? Carrig? Carrig bin. Right. It means sweet rock in sweet Irish. Sweet rock. Okay. Um, and named after the place we used to live in, Jonesville, which was basically a rock farm, <laughs> okay. a gorgeous place up in the woods. Oh, but that's, the name, you, you, that's you and your partner, yeah, right? Yeah, my Who, husband's who's Daniel. That? Yeah, Daniel Lusk, a poet Daniel Lusk. Um, and we, we called our place in Jonesville Carrick Bin, and then we decided to keep the name for our website as well. Of course. And yeah. um, it stuck. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. And we share a website. But um, there are a lot, our books are on there and readings and right, audio right. and all sorts and of things. And you're both award-winning poets. And, we are, uh, I suppose. And you could say wonderful, that, yes. wonderful. <laughs> so thank you. So Angela, what we're going to do the in praise of usefulness, right? Ah uh, yes, if you like. the poems from there. Uh, let's and see now. That would be just uh, wonderful. I'm to think of something that isn't. Um... I'll read this one called Signs. Okay. Uh, I don't think it needs any explanation. Even after I got over all religion, abandoned the very idea of an afterlife, I kept looking for a sign, some directional signal that would indicate stay or go, this man or the other. Like an amputee's limb that continues to agitate after being severed, I wanted answers that were clear, unequivocal, a mathematical equation, a cardinal number. The answer, it turned out, was more like one of those infuriating mystery novels where you get to choose which door your poor protagonist will open as he fumbles for the light switch in the dark. I've never found a sign that wasn't wish fulfillment, a mock-up of my own creation. Like last night, driving home, I found myself meandering down a road I'd never seen before. I had no idea which direction I should take, and for a while I drove as if lifted out of time, cut off from the current of my own existence, no tether tying me to either end. Exhilarating, really, to feel so free. And the sunset, which I hardly ever noticed, was spectacular, all reds and purples deepening to twilight. I passed two horses cropping late October grass by the roadside, the pond behind them a cup of light, that tipped their manes and tails with mercury. But I know better than to call that luminous ploy a portent, a sign. I've always wondered if my real life was being lived by some doppelganger on another dimension of Google.com. 
hang out your shingle, they used to say, and mine might well read, under construction, come back later, closed for repairs. I love that, Angela. I love all the poems. And, well, you're uh, so kind. And oh, this is a treat for all of us to, to read. Uh, uh, poetry is uh, to listen, and, and poetry is such a private act, right? There yes, you that's are true. all alone, yeah. and, uh, but you, you need to communicate. That's right? right. That's right. There's always a reader out there, and of course, all poets want to be heard, listened to, and exchange yes. those experiences with other people, you know. Or, or I think give them that experience, or offer it, I should say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, sometimes I feel as if all my writing is a homage to my parents and a, and a kind of um, uh, penance for all I did wrong, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, But that's another story. Oh. Um, well, will you lead us out then with, with this last poem? Oh, that, sure. That you agreed. And Absolutely. It, thank you so much, Angela Oh, Patton, my pleasure. Thank and you. To, to help celebrate the, the Burlington Irish Heritage Festival, too, here in, in Burlington. You're living right here and, oh, and, indeed, and yes. teaching at the University of Vermont. Absolutely, yes. And you have such a, um, a communal spirit, too, with, with the other poets also. Well, you know, that's yeah. very important to me. Yeah. Um, being an immigrant, and uh, I was terribly homesick when I first came here, and having people around, friends and community, is a huge part of my life, you know. Yeah. Um, it's really my security, you know, and, uh, and a pleasure, too. And not to mention conversation with people like yourself, you know. Okay. Such a pleasure, Angela. Oh, well, thank thank you. you so much. I, I'm going to end with a rather tongue-in-cheek um, poem here. Uh, I have a friend with whom I liked to go occasionally to the spa in Stowe. I haven't done that for a long time, but on occasion. It's called, In Which a Day at the Spa Reminds Me of the Asylum at Saint-Rémy-de-Provence. We loiter in the spa's hushed sanctuary amid the ferns and fall all like hopeful penitents in white robes and plastic sandals, waiting to hear our names discreetly called for treatment. Masquerading as a pair of well-heeled wives with legs long as the pedigrees of pampered house pets, we are the utter monkey's uncle, the genuine cat's pajamas. <laughs> Later strolling in the spa's walled garden among the culinary herbs and flowers, I cannot help but think of Vincent and his brother Theo, walking arm in arm around the asylum at Saint-Rémy-de-Provence. Was this what tortured him, I wonder? This absurd disparity between the pampered and the paupers? Still, it's hard to stop my mouth from watering at the prospect of the body butter, rose petals, and pomegranate polish some faceless staff person will slather on our skins, preparing us to act like happy lunatics when visiting our rolls round. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> thank you, Angela. I can't Angela. resist having fun with it. <laughs> thank thank you. you so much. Thanks so it's much. A pleasure. And, and thank you, viewers. Watch this again and again if you can. Goodbye for now. I sat myself down by a green man tall shade on the beach as the wild waves were rolling.